you for joining us tonight for this very, very interesting lecture. I know it's probably a difficult time for a lot of us joining, concerned about and upset about the war in Karabakh in Armenia. But it's important for us to keep our culture alive, to talk about Armenian culture. And we're very lucky to have David Zakarian from Oxford University. And it's my great pleasure to invite my other colleague, Kagik Stepan Sarkisyan, Armenian Institute's librarian, research advisor, East Armenian teacher, and many other things which I won't mention, uh, to introduce David. Kagik, over to you. Thank you very much, Tatevik. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us at this evening's event on um, Armenian uh, colophones. I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Dr. David Zakarian, our speaker this evening. David received his undergraduate and first post postgraduate degrees at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece, and then obtained his doctorate at Oxford University. He's currently a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at Oxford, working on the colophons of Armenian medieval manuscripts. Uh, Dr. Zakarian's scholarly articles and book chapters have appeared in prestigious publications, and his book entitled Women Too Were Blessed, The Portrayal of Women in Early Christian Armenian Texts, was published in January this year. Today, Dr. Zakarian is going to take us on an illustrated tour of the colophones of medieval Armenian manuscripts. These colophones are like snapshots of life that gives us glimpses into the lives of not only those who produce the manuscripts, like the scribes and the illustrators, but also those who owned them through the ages. So, over to you, David, uh, and let's listen to your fascinating lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gagik, for the introduction. Thank you very much uh, for the, uh, to the Armenian Institute for organizing this talk. Um, indeed, it was psychologically very difficult for me to pull myself together and get away from uh, watching the news of what's happening in Armenia, and I'm sure most of you are following it. And to be honest, I thought this is one thing that I could personally do at least to contribute to the fight of Armenian people, which has been happening throughout the centuries. And I think it would be um, criminal on behalf of the world to allow what happened in Nahijevan already, with the destruction of uh, Armenian cultural heritage there, destruction of uh, 20, more than 20,000 Armenian um, uh, churches and uh, cross stones and other monuments, if, if the same happens in uh, Artsakh, uh, I'm sure we will lose a lot. The humanity will lose a lot. So we need to fight. And I hope to, in one way or another, to contribute to this, just to try and raise the awareness amongst people. And that's why I decided that, yeah, this talk should go on. And I need to speak about that very rich culture that uh, has come to us throughout the centuries. And today I'm going to speak about the project that I've been working for. Uh, three years as a British Academy uh, postdoc. Um, I have already finished that, uh, Gaigik. I finished it uh, in January. So, um, yeah, and um, it's, it's a fascinating topic. And this topic was introduced to me by a scholar in Islamic studies, which is very interesting, who uh, talked to me uh, about this, uh, the, the colophons and said that you have this valuable material and we scholars in other fields who don't have access to classical Armenian, we can't uh, read them. And we know that they contain a lot of information about history of uh, not just Armenians, but also neighboring cultures, the Byzantine Empire, the Islamic world. So, uh, and this is how this project was born. And in the past three years, I've been uh, translating quite a few of them, uh, focusing mostly on the colophons from the late 14th century and 15th century, because this is the period uh, where we have very few of them, very few um, uh, translated colophons. So uh, let me share the screen and um, uh, show you the slides. Um, so the first 
study, scholarly study of uh, the Armenian colophons uh, was published in 1969. It was Professor Avedi Sanjan of uh, UCLA who uh, selected and translated uh, uh, around 600 colophons which tell uh, us the story of invasions into Armenia and how the scribes uh, recorded them in their works. So Avedi Sanjan did a great job there uh, introducing this very important resource to the scholars around the world. Uh, however, as you could see from the title of his 1969 book, it's, uh, he, he intended it to be a source for Middle Eastern history. So the only thing that he did, he translated only those bits and pieces from these uh, colophons, which referred to the history of invasions, primarily uh, the um, uh, whatever he could find on the Turkoman tribes that were coming, attacking, conquering the territory on Kurds, on the Timurid invasions, and so on. And I decided to fill the, the gaps that uh, emerged out of this research because um, there are much more than just invasions, attacks, and wars. The colophons contain uh, rich material about the life of people in the medieval Armenian uh, societies. Hence the title of this talk. But of course, it's a very ambitious title because... Uh, it's uh, virtually impossible to cover all the aspects of it. So what I did uh, for today, I tried to choose bits and pieces from different periods and try to illustrate how we can learn about the life of people in medieval Armenia through those very important um, uh, primary sources. Uh, Overall, we have around 30,000 Armenian manuscripts that have survived uh, till today. Most of them are Gospels. And, of course, it, everything started uh, with the invention of the Armenian alphabet in the 5th century, early 5th century. But interestingly, starting from 5th century until 10th century, we have approximately 60 colophons that have survived. Starting from uh, 10th century onwards, the colophons developed into a different literary genre. So uh, it is important to understand that it becomes something separate. It, it, it acquires its own life within the manuscript. If we consider that we have so many Gospels, more or less the take, text in, in those Gospels would be identical. But the colophons are the ones that differ and provide us with additional information about um, uh, the context of the production of that particular uh, manuscript. Now, the uh, traditional definition, which I took from the uh, recently updated um, manual called Understanding Illuminated Manuscripts, a guide to technical terms, according to that uh, colophon, is an inscription recording information relating to the circumstances of the production of a manuscript or printed book, such as the place, the people involved, and the date. And colophons appear only sporadically in medieval books, but were often employed by the Italian humanists. And the definition finishes with, they are uh, generally located at the end of a book. So this is the a definition which uh, can easily be applied to most manuscripts in the Western tradition. However, this definition is uh, not sufficient uh, and doesn't sufficiently cover the Armenian colophons. That's why I would like to start with the concept of a colophon in the Armenian tradition. So the Armenian word for colophon is hishatakaran. And it is a compound word, as you could see. So it consists of uh, hishatak, uh, as uh, the root of the word, and the suffix of place. Uh, this is an uh, in the Iranian suffix, uh, aran. And hishatak itself consists of hishel and uh, the uh, past participle suffix tak, which comes from Parthian into Armenian, interfix a. And basically, if we literally translate the word uh, hishatakaran into Armenian, it means a place of memory or a place of commemoration. And this is very important to keep in mind. Uh, the normal structure of Armenian colophon varies as well. So normally we start with a doxology or a glory part, uh, or uh, in Armenian we say park. So the, usually the very first word of the colophon is the word park, glory, to, and then uh, um, uh, the, normally the scribe would address uh, God, Christ, 
or some saints. So the first glory goes to them. After that, usually the scribe would in, uh, include in the colophon the date of production, the place of production, sponsor's name or names, sometimes also their families, uh, members of their family. Uh, sometimes we will have religious political authorities, like mentioning during whose reign as Armenian Catholicos this was uh, the manuscript was composed. Uh, very often, of course, we will have also the scribe's name who would identify themselves as a uh, useless or worthless person uh, who is doing this job um, because he was asked uh, to do it. And the most important thing that um, uh, I found there was the historical material. So on top of everything else, we would also have some historical material. Basically, the scribes would reflect on their daily life reflect on what's happening in the country, maybe sometimes write just a story that they heard recently. Occasionally they would try their uh, talent at poetry writing. Some poetry is really exquisite, very beautiful. Other pieces are not so much, well, depending on the talent of the scribe. And the part that uh, really distinguishes the Armenian colophons and is connected with the name Hishatakaran is the remember part. So by all means, an Armenian colophon would have this remember part where they would insist that the readers of the manuscript in their prayers remember certain people. And amongst these people, usually you would have the sponsor again, the sponsor's family. You would have uh, sometimes references to um, uh, their blood relatives. Uh, and of course, if there was any space left on the uh, manuscript, they would also ask the readers to pray for them, uh, for, for the scribes themselves and the scribes' family. So I will show you quite a few examples of these uh, colophons and then I will point out all these um, uh, elements that the Armenian colophons usually have. And uh, in this sense, they are quite different from what we have, as I said, in the uh, Western tradition, even in the Byzantine tradition. So um, if we move forward, I'll show the example from a Bodleian manuscript. Um, this is uh, uh, folio five, so it's a kind of the beginning of the manuscript. If you remember the definition that I uh, read out, in the definition it said that in the Western tradition, usually you have it at the very end of the manuscript. That's true, but partially in the Armenian tradition. So on the right, at least uh, for me, it's on my right hand, I'm trying to show you, is uh, the original colophon of this particular manuscript. This was a serial of Alexandria's um, um, treatise in which um, he defends the uh, non-Chalcedonian or uh, the Diophysite uh, Christology. And it was copied by one of the uh, greatest fathers of the Armenian church, by Grigor Tatevati in 1379. And the manuscript that we have now is the 17th century copy. But the, uh, the scribe decided that it would be a good idea to include also the great church father's colophon there. So he included it after the... Um Can you hear me now? Because it said that I've been muted. Yes, we can now. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. So uh, on the left-hand side, you could uh, see the table of contents and the colophon follows immediately after that. However, the same manuscript has also um, uh, another, the, the, the latest colophon, so to say. As you could see, it's at the very end of the um, uh, manuscript on folios uh, 197, um, um, recto and verso. And here on the left, uh, if you are careful, uh, well, this is on two pages, and I have highlighted the first page. Here it is. So if you could read here, the letter P is in red. This is the word park, glory. So this is how a, traditionally a colophon would uh, start. And I've seen this particular pattern in many, many colophons, which is interesting that only the letter P is uh, highlighted like this. So on this example, uh, we could see that the colophon may appear 
at the beginning or at the very end. Sometimes it may appear also in the middle of the manuscript because the scribe just managed from practical point of view, managed to find some space there and write some um, uh, prayers or uh, a note for people uh, who are going to read it. Uh, another very uh, beautiful one that I found uh, recently, this is a, a manuscript, uh, this is a gospel I uh, kept in Berlin, and uh, this is folio um, uh, two, as you could see, again, the beginning of the manuscript, and here in between the two figures, the Virgin Mary, and I guess this is Ga Gabriel, we could see an inscription which was left by, a, um, by the scribe most likely. So if we uh, go closer to it, we see that here we have the text uh, So uh, basically uh, the scribe says the uh, unworthy remember the unworthy Makartich. Most likely this Makartich is the person who copied this manuscript. And then he adds that Aszakoras, that is the illuminator, the person who did this beautiful um, uh, illuminations. And uh, the next bit is Askasmoras, the, the person who bound the manuscript together. And then this uh, last bit, Aszez, which refers to the people who are going to read this manuscript. This is also a typical thing where the scribe uh, asks uh, the readers to remember in their prayers the people who produce this manuscript. And this as this, uh, basically, if we uh, open it up, it means also God will remember you. So it's a reference to the fact that that will benefit you as well. So this gives us a little bit of um, insight into the mentality of people at the time in medieval Armenia. It was very important for them to be remembered in prayers. This is, of course, not just in Armenia, but it was, uh, it's, a, it's an ancient tradition. It, it is connected with the, um, the cult of uh, the ancestors, where uh, even in Zoroastrian times, we have this in Armenia as well, that uh, the, the ancestors have to be remembered because this is the only way for them to find peace in the other world. And uh, in the Christian tradition, this is one of the ways that they can be saved during the Judgment Day. So it, it, it really meant a lot for, for an Armenian scribe to include a colophon in the uh, manuscript. Um, the colophons are uh, also very interesting uh, in the sense that they tell us a lot about the Armenian uh, way, uh, the Armenian calendar, how the Armenians presented the, uh, the dates. So uh, the first example is quite a simple one. As you could see, um, it says it was completed, uh, completed this holy and furnished with light manuscript on the 10th of July in the year 835 of the Armenian era. So the Armenian era was a date which was used very often in the manuscripts. And according to the scholars, in order to get the, the, the Gregorian uh, calendar or the, the, our calendar so that we could compare the dates, we need to add 551 in order to get the date. Hence, we have 1386. This, there is a very long tradition uh, related to this. I'm not going to go into details, but uh, whenever you see an inscription like this, and this is also true about the Hachkars and about the inscriptions on the churches. So in in most cases, you have it according to the Armenian calendar. So if you want to get the date, you usually add um, 551. And the, day, the first day of the year was 11th of July, if I'm not mistaken. So there is a, a lot of discrepancy there. Uh, also, from one of the colophons, I realized that the medieval Armenian scribes liked mathematics a lot. So, and this is the example of that. So uh, one of them decided to use all the calendars that he knew to present the precise date when he copied this manuscript. So you could see on your screens, in the year 6630, since the expulsion of Adam from paradise, so they knew the exact date when it happened. And then according to uh, Septuagint, it's 6630. This is the date how they calculate it, uh, which means it's 1430. Um, uh, 1430. And again, in the year 6855, since Adam uh, 
uh, according to the uh, quincentenary of the philosopher Aeas, devised at the meeting of Alexander, and so on. As you could see, it's quite a long uh, calculation, mathematical calculation. And only in the end, he says that according to the great Armenian era, 879, which brings us to... So the, um, the scribe went into great lengths to try and convey the precise date when he finished copying this manuscript. And he also mentioned the month, August, and this is also interesting that um, uh, for months, primarily the uh, Latin um, uh, months were used at the time. Uh, and, um, well, for the days of the week, it could be also the Persian, but... Um, it's a mix of different calendars here, as you could see. Now, uh, for the usefulness of the colophons. Now, this is one colophon which is very controversial, but I decided to include it in today's talk. Uh, it is controversial for several reasons. So first of all, it's the only, uh, the first evidence and perhaps the only one in the manuscript which tells us about the establishment of the Bagratid um, uh, royal uh, dynasty in Armenia. So according to this colophon, this was copied at the beginning of the reign of Ashot of the Bagratuni family by the hand of unworthy Grigor Mashkevor during the pontificate of Catholicos Georg, who anointed Ashot as king of Armenia in the year 333 of our calendar, hence for uh, 884. On the 10th of the month of Karots in the holy Skanchelagort monastery which is uh, near Lake Van, uh, north of Lake Van, this monastery. Now, this is a controversial um, uh, colophon in the sense that most people, uh, the manuscript itself doesn't clearly say whether this last letter of the number, is it G or D, because the Armenian letters are very similar. And one of the scholars even built a huge theory based on this, saying that this is a wrong date and it should be D, because somehow they calculated that this particular day that is mentioned here corresponds to Wednesday. And the Armenian church would never anoint anyone on Wednesday because that's the day when uh, usually Patarak is not uh, performed. It's the day when Christ was um, betrayed. So this can't be correct and that's why it should be uh, D. So I will not go too much into these details, but the interesting bit about this particular colophon is that it provides us with a very important piece of information about where, for example, uh, the Bagratuni um, uh, king, the first Bagratuni king, was uh, anointed as, as a king, and uh, who did this, and so on. So in that sense, uh, they are also very, very important. And that's our only uh, source, as I said. Um, if we move on, uh, in, the, in the colophons, we can find some interesting uh, stuff, like, um, as you could see here, I put as a title, Purchase and Contract. So in fact, they would have a contract, an actual contract, uh, copied, written at the end of the manuscript. So in this particular one, we see pious and humble. Um, uh, by the way, the dots that you see usually, it's um, uh, because the glory part has been omitted. Because most of the colophons were put together into volumes uh, during the Soviet time, and uh, it was not very popular to glorify God. So usually in those books, you have only the first word, glory, dot, 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 and then the rest of the text, which uh, the editor would consider to be uh, important. So that um, part related to glorifying God is usually omitted. So that's why I, I also used only this bit. So pious and humble Hovannes and his modest wife Nurmelik longed for Christ's love and his kingdom, and encouraged by pious and faithful Lord Baron Hasbek, well deservedly bought the Jashot, that is a missile, um, uh, that speaks of God, paying 650 in silver to Amir Sarkis, the nephew of priest Karapet, as a lasting memorial <coughs> for themselves and their parents. So this this is a typical thing that tells us something about the mentality of people. 650 silver coins is quite a lot for that time. Um, uh, we speak about the end of the 14th century, and this is in particular uh, after the devastations of the Timurids in Armenia. So 650 silver coins 
corresponded to um, uh, quite a lot of money. If we consider, I'll just give you the context so that you understand. Um, uh, when the Timurids attacked uh, the Armenian villages, there is this colophon saying that uh, the Armenian uh, prisoners were sold at the price of 200 or 300 silver coins to their relatives as a ransom. So to free them, you had to pay the ransom. And so if for a human being, they would pay around 300 of these coins, you can imagine how much 650 is. So, and this is uh, important because they would spend a lot of money to get a, a, a gospel. Usually it would, uh, would be a gospel uh, as a lasting memorial. So this is again uh, linked to the memory that people would remember those who contributed to the creation of that um, uh, manuscript. And we could see here the details. This colophon was written in the year 1390 since the birth, uh, birth of Christ, according to the Armenian calendar, which according to the Greeks is 1396. You see a very big discrepancy. That's six years, quite a lot. And with the Franks, it's again two years difference. And according to the Syrians, uh, a different calendar and so on. And this is the first bit of the colophon where the scribe tells us uh, who paid and why they paid this money. And the second bit of this colophon is actually like a real contract. So we read that I, Hovane, so uh, unfortunately I couldn't access the manuscript itself, so I don't know if this is written by different hands. Uh, that would be very uh, fascinating to see. But I assume it would be because they start with the uh, uh, pronoun I. So I, Hovanes, bought this manuscript from the nephew of priest Karapet for 600 spitak. Spitak is the Armenian word for silver coins. In the presence of the landlords. And then we have the landlords. Uh, I assume some important people who had to justify that the, uh, and uh, testify that this um, exchange of money and the manuscript really took place. So I, Puzmish the Greek, the um, uh, Karhanchi, this is a Persian word, which um, according to the Dictionary of Middle Armenian means an employer, uh, Gortatu. So uh, I don't know exactly what was his um, uh, profession. So I have witnessed this writing. And then we have Melikset and Mekartish, two brothers were witnesses. We don't have their profession. Uh, we have Hindu Shais, who was a, um, uh, a chef, uh, is a witness. Yevat Shai, uh, a vintner. Uh, in that area again, the son of uh, Tafrezlu are witnesses. And the last person is a tailor who witnessed this. Now, uh, this is kind of a, a, a contract which could have been uh, also in uh, contemporary times where people just justify and sign their names uh, saying that, yes, this is indeed uh, what happened. Uh, it was very important for them because uh, the manuscripts themselves were very valuable, not uh, from the point of view of a financial um, value, but mostly for the emotional, um, uh, emotional and sentimental value. So some people would just spend all their savings on sponsoring a manuscript because they would think that this is the only way they could preserve the memory of their family. Otherwise, they can't do anything else. This was the only way with which they could donate the manuscript to a church and people in the church would come and go and read, that is the monks, would read out their names, would pray for the salvation of their souls. So that was a very important act for them. That's why uh, it was important also to have a sort of certificate clearly stating that, yes, this was paid by this particular people and it is certified. This is not very common, however, this type of uh, contract, but um, uh, I found this very interesting. Another one, uh, which was uh, which had a title, uh, the Armenian title of Vajarman Git, like an invoice. So again, a similar sort of thing we, in which we read that in the name of God, I Martyros, son of uh, Abraham, the son of the priest Tadeos, Tadeus, Tadeus brother, when my uncle father's brother in that sense uncle the priest tadeos passed away i martyros sold his gospel to the priest hakob for 600 dahekan 
So we see that in this case, we have it the other way around. When a lay person uh, had in the family this particular gospel manuscript and he sells it to the church. With that money, and this is an interesting uh, bit, and uh, I'm sure Susan will be happy to see this bit uh, because she gave a fascinating talk about matah in the Armenian tradition. So with that money, I bought a cow and an ox and made a matah, that is a, an animal sacrifice, for the priest Tadeos. Uh, because as uh, previously we read, Tadeos was his uncle and he wanted to honor his uncle. From now on, whoever argues with regard to this gospel from amongst either my relatives or foreigners, may they be cursed by the 318 patriarchs. This is a very typical curse that we find in many manuscripts. This is a reference to uh, 318 patriarchs of the Council of Nicaea, 325, the first ecumenical council which joined, uh, which brought together uh, representatives of different churches and they kind of created this unified idea of a church and the Armenian Church was presented there by the son of uh, St. Gregory the Illuminator, by Aristagius. Um, so this is a, a typical thing. They are like the sacred patriarchs of the Christian tradition. So it was a very heavy curse put on this. So if anyone dares to remove it or claim uh, that that, that uh, gospel belonged to them. And then we see the continuation of the curse. And may they bear partial responsibility for the sins of Judah, the crucifier, and Cain. So quite heavy for a Christian person to um, dare and touch this uh, manuscript. Uh, so basically in this way he um, <laughs> secures uh, the, um, uh, the manuscript uh, as a belonging, as a, pos uh, as a possession of priest Hakob. And then again, we have witnesses witnessed by the Muslim Mutam Pasha, giving us a little bit of information again about the area where this is happening and how the Muslims also, to a certain degree, participated in, the, um, uh, um, in this sort of um, transactions. Witnessed by Eyat Kar and so on. So we could see again a long list of people who witnessed this and confirmed that this now belongs to uh, the priest Hakob. Uh, so from this manuscript, we, we see again a, a bit of insight into the fact that uh, the Armenians uh, had this matah concept for a long period of time. Um, and uh, this is another evidence for that as well. Um, and then we have the uh, kind of continuation of the same colophon where Hakob himself speaks uh, about uh, this manuscript and says that I, the unworthy priest Hakob, uh, falling down on my face, beseech everyone who by reading or copying comes across this holy, divine and pure treasury to remember with all your heart, my parents, my father Pesik and my mother Naz, as well as my brothers Vartan, Sewalan, Meliksai uh, and so on. You could see the list is long. Uh, the more we move towards a uh, modern period, like 17th, 18th century, this list becomes even longer. So there are some manuscripts that I have uh, seen from um, Isfahan primarily. Um, uh, they have uh, several pages of names mentioned there. And it was the obligation of people who possessed this, who read it, um, uh, to remember these names in the prayers. So... And then, um, uh, in the end, I want just to point out that one very interesting uh, phrase here. This is something that you find, uh, I have highlighted, underlined it, fairly earned assets. So this is um, a very common uh, formula found in many, many manuscripts. It was important for the owner of the manuscript or uh, the sponsor of the manuscript to stress that he's paying for this particular uh, manuscript by fairly earned assets. And usually the, um, the, um, uh, the word halal was used here. Halal ashkatatsas, halal gortsas. So this, was, uh, this is a really interesting um, uh, phrasing, but it is found in, in manuscripts uh, starting from the uh, 14th century onwards. 
very often. So this tells us a little bit about their mentality as well, that you couldn't sponsor something sacred if uh, the money that you were paying with were not earned fairly. So they would understand that this is important. So I will pay for fairly earned assets. Um, and this is, as you could see, from the uh, 1413. Um, it's also important to mention that not only men could sponsor or did indeed sponsor a manuscript, but also uh, we find a lot of women doing it for various reasons again. Uh, I chose uh, two colophons. Uh, this one is really uh, interesting because we have, uh, first of all, a very unusual name. So the name uh, for a woman, Gariane. So we would expect it to be Gariane, but it's Gariane in this, uh, in this case. And um, the content is also very interesting. So according to the first bit of the colophon, uh, may you remember in Lord the aforementioned Gariane and her husband, Smeon, who departed to Christ, as well as their parents, her father, Shahrakan, her mother and her children, Hayot and Ustiane, her son, Melike, as well as her son, Johannes, who departed to God and her nephew, that is sister's son, the Mahtesi Sarkis, together with all their blood relatives. So we could see that from this uh, first bit that uh, she sponsored, uh, this uh, Galiana sponsored this manuscript because she lost many members of her family. And uh, they are mentioned in this bit. And she wants uh, the priests, the monks, and anyone else who comes across this manuscript while reading to pray for the salvation of these people, of their souls. Uh, an, an interesting uh, word here is Mahtesi, Mahtesi Sarkis. So uh, this word uh, finds different forms in Armenian. Uh, we have uh, primarily Mahtesi or Mahtesi. Uh, this was a title usually given to people who went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So if someone went to Jerusalem, came back, they would be called Mahtesi. Basically, that was also a very important um, achievement for a Christian Armenian in the Middle Ages. And the second bit, um, uh, we have Ay Garyane. Again, unfortunately, I, can't, I couldn't uh, see the actual manuscript uh, to uh, try and identify whether it was indeed written, uh, written by her or the scribe just uh, was writing it um, as a dictation. But it is uh, not unlikely that she wrote this by herself. Um, uh, I've seen uh, a 17th century manuscript copied entirely. The entire gospel manuscript was copied by a woman scribe, but we have very few of them uh, in the earlier period. But I'm sure that she, uh, it's highly likely that she wrote it uh, herself. She knew how to read and write. So we could see that um, in this particular case, um, she stresses that uh, she lives in the village of Haitar, and she gave this book to the Church of the Holy Mother of God as a memorial for myself and my husband, as well as my parents and all my blood relatives. So this is the Hishel part, the remember part, where you need to mention the people that you want to be uh, remembered in the prayers. I placed it in the Church of the Holy Mother of God, which is in the village of Haitar, as a memorial, an indelible memorial till the coming of Christ. And if any of my children or relatives dares either to sell or to pawn or to cut a page of this book, may Christ God cut them from within. A very uh, strong uh, curse, uh, I guess. And put that part next to the unbelievers. And may the priests or deacons or servants of the church who will come across this book take care of it by not keeping it uncovered and by not putting it uncovered on a stone. May they be blessed by Christ, and may the priest Johannes be the guardian and the person in charge of the book. So, and you could see the colophon was written in 1412. So, uh, technically, she paid for this. It was uh, copied, and it was kept in the church. And whenever they were reading, so um, in this case, we don't know exactly, but uh, most of you who've been to, for example, uh, Gerard Monastery in, in Armenia, you might have seen uh, an inscription on one of the walls where it says uh, a similar thing that uh, please pray 
for the soul of this particular person. And there are details on how often the, the, the priests have to pray for, for them. This is something that also we can find in uh, manuscripts. Um, if we move on, uh, this is another a colophon, a very interesting one. Um, here we have a different lady who sponsored it. So again, we start with, may you remember the last recipient um, or the purchaser, we could say, of this, Baron Shah, alongside his parents and all blood relatives. May you also remember my daughter-in-law, Jahan Melik, along with her parents who longed for this priceless pearl, this desirable manuscript, which is royal, the one that Jahan Melik's daughter of Lord Grigor asked for and received it for her fairly earned assets. Again, we have the fairly earned assets stressed. As she gave her nashan, now this is an interesting detail about the life of people. So this is a, a married woman who paid for this manuscript, and we could see the money that she received for her nashan. So nashan is the engagement. So for her engagement, she was given 3,000 spitak, uh, the silver coins, and for her yerestes, and uh, this is another um, uh, traditional thing that was happening. Yerestes literally means to see the face. So the ceremony of seeing her face. So we could assume that as a young lady, her face was covered. And when uh, the, um, um, uh, the in-laws, the to-be in-laws came to visit her, they paid a certain amount of money so that they could see her face before asking her to marry their uh, son. So this tells us a little bit of their traditions. And this tradition has been uh, preserved in, uh, in, Armenian, in different Armenian uh, villages um, until uh, 20th century, early 20th century. The ethnographic evidence clearly shows that this was the case. And we could see that uh, this woman, uh, this um, uh, Jahan Melik, used all her money for that particular purpose. So she decided to donate all this money for the creation of this particular uh, manuscript. And this happened in 1387. Um, now, one more thing that the manuscripts uh, allow us to do is to access the uh, development of the Armenian language. And this particular one I have chosen um, is from Jerusalem. It was copied in uh, Jerusalem in 1335. Um, I'm not going to go into details. I just highlighted some of the words that are not from classical Armenian. And they are clearly dialectal forms or forms used just by uh, the particular group of people. So um, the ones that you could see here, I have just uh, written down here. So for example, the word Hergel, uh, is not uh, classical Armenian, is not a um, uh, very common word, but uh, in some dialects until today we use this word uh, in the meaning of to send, or the word ashtish or ashtesh, which is um, uh, the, the word for uh, lance. Uh, the classical Armenian word is ashte, so a slightly different form. Rah is a Persian word that was used uh, very often, uh, which means a road. And uh, you could see uh, some other uh, words here, some other interesting aspects. So basically the colophons also allow us to identify some dialectal forms in different parts of um, uh, the Armenian speaking world. So uh, we can identify what was the Armenian they spoke there and how this developed uh, later on and how we got uh, different dialects at the time. Although most um, uh, scribes are trying to stick to classical Armenian rules, but uh, some of them are not well educated, so it, uh, they can't always do that. Um, I think we don't have much time. So what I would do, I will skip this one. Um, uh, maybe I'll just mention this briefly because it's a bit, uh, it, it, it's interesting. This is a, a manuscript, um, a very famous one in the 14th century. It was a book of seven virtues by Peter of Aragon. So this manuscript was usually uh, used by the Catholic Armenians who tried to convert the non-Catholic, that is the apostolic Armenians, to Catholicism. And this book uh, was very, very popular in the time of Grigor 
So what Datevatsi did, he took this book, he read it, and he realized that this is indeed a very important and interesting book. He understood why the um, uh, apostolic Armenians would by reading this book, decide to uh, accept Catholicism. So he, uh, he, he used a very uh, sneaky tactic. So he copied the entire manuscript himself and left out the bits which do not correspond to uh, apostolic Armenian creed. And this is seen from the interaction on the folios of the manuscript. Basically, uh, a Catholic Armenian took this uh, manuscript, started reading it, and realized that Datevatsi has omitted certain bits or changed them. So, and he started writing comments in the places where he realized there was a mistake and Datevatsi uh, changed certain things. Very interesting uh, that in the 14th century we have this sort of censorship here. So, I won't go into uh, details of this, but this is a, a fascinating example how. Um, uh, the colophon that was uh, later on inserted in the book explains why this was happening. Um, so this is this uh, Catholic Armenian Ignatius, who calls himself Ignatius, who uh, curses Grigor Tatevatsi and says that you um, uh, put many weeds into this beautiful manuscript. Or Tatevatsi, aren't you afraid of God mixing your poison with unadulterated wine and things like this? And uh, we have uh, the um, colophon written by Datevatsi, who justifies uh, his choice. He says, uh, there are mistakes, yes, I accept, because I had two samples of the same manuscript, and um, uh, which, as he says, is shown in every place where it is written twice. And sometimes when ideas seem doubtful, I left space and put the sign of doubt, and I beseech you to put this right and not to simply criticize me. So this kind of conversation is happening on the folios of a manuscript. Um, and uh, this manuscript, in fact, is a huge one. It's, uh, I looked at how many folios it is. I think it's around 600, 700 uh, folios, a huge one. And it was used in teaching. And as you could see, one of the board students wrote this in, the, uh, in one of the folios. Um, uh, I guess he got bored uh, not even halfway through of that manuscript. So he is complaining that uh, it's endless and he can't finish uh, it uh, very quickly. So you could see it on your screen. With my limping donkey, when will I reach uh, the end of this writing? A desperate um, plea for help. And uh, some more examples about the life of people. So this was uh, a fascinating one for me because this was uh, copied in Cilicia. And this is the period where we learn about, a little bit about the Armenian history of the time, uh, beginning of the 14th century where there, there are some conversations about the Armenian church coming into communion with the Greek or with the um, uh, Catholic church. In this particular uh, period, it's with the Catholic church. And so slowly certain things are starting to change, but there is a strong reaction amongst the Armenian priests. And this particular gospel was written by a scribe who uh, complains uh, about the situation. And he says the following words. This holy gospel was copied in the country of Cilicia in the congregation of Pos in the year uh, 758 of the Armenian era under the auspices of the Holy Mother of God and Saint Gregory our Illuminator during the reign of Oshin, uh, Oshin and the pontificate of Lord Constant who in this year exiled us to the island of Cyprus because we did not obey the Chalcedonian heresy. So they refused to go alongside the official policy of the Armenian church leaders of the time, and they were exiled. Not a bad place to go to an exile, of course, to Cyprus, but this is kind of the beginning where a huge Armenian uh, congregation uh, was built there and uh, the Armenian churches were built. Um, one more uh, quick example here is uh, that tells us a little bit again about the life of people there. You could see that the scribe uh, thought it's a very uh, good thing uh, to do to remember the person who helped them. So he uh, writes this on, uh, on two occasions in the same manuscript. Christ God, with the intercession of your holy sufferings, have mercy on Mahdasi Shakarbek, who brought us today apricots and apples. 
So this is a, a, a small touch about the life of people there. And so we could see the traditional Armenian fruit is mentioned here, the apricot. And again, uh, I guess this happened uh, on a different occasion as well. So the scribe thought, I have to write it again. And he says again the same uh, kind words that um, um, uh, console in the ranks of the holy apostles of yours, the soul of Mahda Sishakarbek who brought us today good apricots. This time they were good ones and apples, as well as me, the unworthy scribe, Hakob. They were all very shy and called themselves uh, unworthy um, and uh, untalented. And uh, um, uh, I want to finish on this because uh, I uh, spend most of my time here. You could see um, uh, the link to the uh, Himnadram. So this is the Pan-Armenian fund that uh, supports uh, the displaced people of Artsakh at the moment. And one thing that we could do is to contribute to it and try to help these people. Uh, at the moment, there are more than uh, 70,000 people displaced from their homes and they uh, need our support. And um, I would be um, really very happy if you could in any way contribute to this. Um, and on this, I will uh, stop and... I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. This was fascinating. We, I expected a lot of things, but I didn't expect this will be quite so funny and joyful. Loved about limping donkey and the guy who was into his dates and maths calculating. And also we know how to get into Holy Apostles uh, group by bringing good apricots and apples. So that's it. Um, anyway, thank you very much, and we can now pass on some questions too. And I know my uh, colleague Gagik already has a question for you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vic, and, and thank you very much, uh, David, for this fascinating introduction to the world of Armenian um, uh, colophones. You have lived up to your reputation of a crowd puller at the Armenian Institute. Because I remember the first time you, you gave a talk on uh, women and the Christianization of Armenia. Uh, we had a full house with standing room only at, um, at Haidun. So uh, this isn't any different. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I have one question for you uh, from the examples you showed us. And I'm sure there must be thousands like that. Uh, they all, they are very rich repositories of personal names, female and male, many of them no longer in use. Have these been, and their origins, have their origins been studied? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, I, I was myself fascinated by that because quite a few of the names are not, they don't sound Armenian. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have um, a family that is presented, like a long list of people who belong to that family. And uh, some of them have uh, clearly Armenian names, traditional Armenian names. But at the same time, then you find some other names which are more like uh, Muslim names or um, maybe, I don't know, sometimes it's a Kurdish name, Turkish name, Persian name. And why was this the case? I don't have the answer yet, but we have really so many examples of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's a very good project to try and study, but yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Your next project. <laughs> <laughs> if not, can I ask one supplementary question, please? Oh. Um, could you say something briefly about the geographical stretch of these uh, colophones. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's an excellent uh, question and an excellent topic for research. There are some people who work on this. Um, uh, so the stretch is amazing. If you uh, just take the Middle Ages, we will have, uh, because we have manuscripts uh, from Poland, uh, from uh, Crimea, I'm just trying to get the uh, extremes so that I could yeah. uh, basically yeah. cover as much as possible. So we have colophons from um, uh, from Greece, from uh, some of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there is one from uh, Athens uh, that I came across. And then, of course, you have quite a lot from Cilicia, Cyprus mm. is the case. So it's a... Uh, um, Basically, wherever you have an Armenian community, mm. you have a church, you have scribes, 
and they will definitely write a copy a manuscript mm -hmm. and of course you will have um uh, some material about this place so like that we have quite a lot from Crimea because that uh, especially after the uh, Timurid invasion of the Caucasus quite a few Armenians uh, fled to Crimea Crimea and uh, there we have uh, Armenian churches uh, still functioning Armenian churches mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of work has been done uh, there and so we have manuscripts and from there people also moved uh, towards uh, Poland and then um, Eastern Europe so yes it's it's a it's a vast uh, area and uh, one of the scholars Emmanuel um, Vandel I'm sorry I uh, always mispronounce his surname Van, uh, Vandel Welchen, if I'm not mistaken, um, sorry if he's uh, listening, um, uh, he's doing this project with the formula. So he managed to identify that certain formulaic expressions were used in different parts of uh, the world, of Armenian uh, speaking world. And he, he manages to trace uh, the scribes, the school of uh, copying or um, uh, writing, how uh, some scribes uh, move or how a manuscript moves from one location to another one. So like you have the same formula found, let's say, in Silesia, and then suddenly the same formula appears in Poland, somewhere in Krakow. So this is another uh, research um, that is being uh, done um, uh, right now. So that also shows how the manuscripts traveled mm. from one place uh, to another. Okay. And uh, I should I should say uh, indeed what uh, you mentioned that this is not even the fraction of what we have in the uh, uh, colophons. I just try to bring some striking examples, uh, some uh, bits and pieces to show you the the richness of this material. Yeah. And of course, it needs a lot of work, still a lot of work. But one thing I should stress here that um, the colophons are not for writing a global history. They are very local. They are very personal. They, they are about just uh, people living in a particular place uh, at a particular time. They might reflect on general global issues as well, but that's not their main um, uh, idea. Their main idea is to try and convey this message of the, the importance of remembering in the prayers people who contributed to the creation of this uh, manuscript because it was important for all of them. As um, Tigran Kuyumjan, one of the greatest scholars of uh, Armenian studies, uh, mentioned, uh, when you read colophons, you think as if people are uh, collecting votes to get into uh, paradise, because the more people pronounce their names in front of God in uh, prayers, the more chances you have to get into heaven. So that's a very good uh, comparison. We have one from Garo Bebrarian asking if the use of colophons is used by other groups, other nations, like the Greeks and the Russians? All the manuscript traditions have colophons. They do have colophons, but most of them are like the ones that I, uh, the, the definition of which I read at the beginning. So that's the definition that normally this is what you have. You get just the reference to the sponsor, to the date uh, when it was done, and uh, the place. That's the basic information. Uh, just to illustrate, uh, to, to, to provide more details on this, um, um, I, I gave a talk at SOAS um, um, uh, a couple of years ago, which was a, a workshop where people from different traditions were presenting, were speaking about uh, colophons. And I found out one very interesting thing, that you might find something similar to Armenian tradition in uh, Islamic tradition. However, again, it's quite limited there as well. So like the contract things you will find in Islamic tradition as well. Uh, the things, uh, the curses, for example, also you may find there, but uh, not much about uh, historical background. So they don't go into too many details. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the Hebrew tradition has something close to Armenian ones, but I think... Um, uh, it's not as a genre as, as we have it in the Armenian tradition. The Armenian one developed from the 10th century, as I said, into a clear genre of literature. Mm. So with its uh, rules and uh, specific terminology, words and uh, everything else. And this is how they are studied nowadays. David, thank you for a really rich talk. It was, and somehow it brings everything to life when you start going into the details of the colophons. One thing I noticed when you were talking about the contract B, um, this 
Greek, who was the one of the witnesses, Buzmis, the Greek. Yeah, um, I think I think he was an innkeeper because Kerkhane in Turkish is is a is a tavern, and it mm-hmm. reads like Kerkhaneji, and all the other witnesses seem to be. Um, connected with the trade somehow so that's that's a yeah, that's, suggestion. yeah yeah huh? i think okay. that's a, that's a very good idea as i said i i i, I didn't know the word so i i searched it in this middle armenian dictionary which had that particular that uh, that was the only uh, definition like an employer it, I, uh, so what does that mean in particular it's a very generic uh, word but um yeah, I think uh, that would be a very good explanation. What I don't is. know whether it's a pure Turkish word. I've heard it spoken in it's, Cyprus. It's, 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 Erkhane, a, per- Erkhane. It's, it's um, a Persian word, and it means uh, the, someone who op- owns or operates a workshop or a small factory. Oh. Uh-huh. Okay. So that it, Gortatu is, is, is an adequate uh, um, synonym for it. Okay. Yeah. okay. In, in Cyprus, a Kerkhaneci would be a tavern owner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I have a couple of questions. One is, if who, when the when the people were exiled to um, Cyprus, actually, who was governing Cyprus at the time? Was that in the 14th century? I was that quite was interested. The beginning of the 14th century, yes. So um, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was under the control of the Crusaders at the time. Yeah. Still. Yeah, and so uh, that's why uh, one, uh, the allies of the Crusaders sent them there as an exile, because most likely it wasn't that densely populated or it was far away from it. I guess it was just a strategic uh, point uh, at the time. But uh, yeah, this is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of the earliest evidences, uh, evidence of uh, Armenian, um, Armenians there in oh. Cyprus and yeah most likely this is how the community then uh, grew and they built a church there if I'm not mistaken in Famagusta. There was a monastery. Yeah uh, yeah. Um, but, but what was really interesting is that you said in some of the colophons people even wrote poetry and I was wondering what other literature what other writing survived could have survived apart from the gospels and and the holy manuscripts is is was there much left what can you tell us a little bit more about that um because these people were not just scribes were they they were also writers some of them um so most of uh, the manuscripts that we have are indeed gospels for that particular reason that they were made because people would read them in the church as a, a part of as a commemoration as a memory because it would contribute to their salvation. So that's why they would choose to uh, to sponsor a gospel rather than anything else. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is, uh, we know this from the genocide stories, that the Armenians uh, escaping the genocide would save, try to save yeah. the gospels that was very important and anything that was uh, close to the church to the faith so th- this is why we have so many gospels that survived uh, after the genocide but we had schools monastic schools and universities right uh, well type of universities especially the one with Grigor Tatevati uh, that I mentioned the uh, Tatev monastery so we have a lot of manuscripts from different other uh, authors so some of them are uh, by um, uh, the translations from uh, let's say Latin authors like uh, we have Thomas Aquinas work uh, copied in those manuscripts uh, yeah. translated into Armenian yes and um, uh, copied there uh, we have of course quite a few manuscripts from earlier period like um, Philo of Alexandria, some manuscripts have been preserved only in Armenian because uh, in the monasteries they were used for education. And uh, from the uh, uh, from the late 14th century, the Armenians, especially in Tatev Monastery, they adopted the Latin way of education. So they were um, uh, where you have theology and philosophy at the same time. So they needed material, and this material would come normally from uh, Latin sources or Greek sources. So the translations were happening. That's why we have other uh, manuscripts as well but um, uh, and of course the histories histories of Armenia we have manuscripts which were uh, written uh, sponsored by a specific family uh, where they would uh, just preserve the history of the family like uh, Tomar Zruni and uh, many others we have uh, treatises uh, like um, um, uh, Vartan Arevelti so 
there is a wide variety of other texts, but most of them were used for education, for teaching. Uh, that's why we don't have as many of them preserved, just one or two copies. Um, uh, uh, there are, for example, Yeznik, if I'm not mistaken, we have only one copy of Yeznik's uh, treatise survived, which is um, uh, pity, but at least we have that uh, fifth century text. So, yeah, they were copying quite a few, especially, uh, and, and in some cases it was part of their education. So to learn calligraphy, to learn how to spell words, and so on. So a copying was part of uh, that education. I am there. Uh, I, was, I was wanting a little bit more contrasting the Armenian colophons with the Western tradition. So obviously Armenian colophons had more material, but what other differences were there? So, as I said, the main uh, difference was that um, in the Western tradition, it was only to state the, uh, the, the origin of the manuscript. But the, for the Armenians, it was uh, a place of memory. This is the key to remember, that the colophon, the Armenian word um, uh, for colophon, Hishatakaran, is very important. When um, uh, I organized a workshop in Oxford uh, regarding this, and there were quite a few uh, scholars from uh, around the world, uh, prominent scholars, who, they were discussing the term for uh, about a half an hour, just the term, because that term doesn't represent the uh, English word colophon, which comes from Greek, uh, but it doesn't, the Armenian uh, texts do not represent exactly what we have in other traditions. So it's, um, uh, you must have a colophon, you must have it in the manuscript so that people could pray for those who contributed to it. It's a kind of, that's why it's called Hishatakaran, a place of memory. It must be there and it depends on how uh, much space there was left. So that's why some colophons are very short because there wasn't much space uh, in the end and they would just put down a couple of words saying, please remember, that's it. And in other cases, if the scribe had the time, had the money, they would start copying and writing a lot. There are many instances like uh, stories about personal stories as well there. Uh, one um, uh, very interesting colophon was the scribe starts writing the colophon and then he says, uh, we have to flee. Unfortunately, I can't finish it because the enemy is attacking. And then he finishes it after two months. He says, for two months, we were in the mountains hiding because the enemy, it was about the Timurid invasion again. Uh, we were hiding there. And now finally, when the enemy is gone, I have the time to finish this colophon and so on. So that sort of stories we don't have in the Western tradition. And um, this is why it makes it so um, precious and unique and important. How come the Armenians managed to have a completely different approach to this? Does it say um, something about their personality at the time? <laughs> I think this is, uh, I tried to trace this back to um, pre-Christian Armenia. Because uh, this, uh, the cult of ancestors, the, the fact that you need to remember your ancestors, to remember people um, uh, who uh, are not with us anymore, was very important. It was part of the culture, part of the mentality. And... This is why you have it also uh, enshrined in the, in the manuscripts. That became a way of keeping that memory. So they found this as a kind of the only way to do it. Uh, and as I said, also linking to Christian tradition, yes, the more people uh, pronounce your name or pray. Uh, although there is a colophon where it says, um, please pray for Makartich and the other Makartich and also the other person who came and helped us in the monastery without the name, but kind of implying that God knows who that person was. You just read this and say, uh, God save his soul. So it is part of this mentality of people that we need to keep the memory of uh, diseased people. People are gone, they're not with us. We, need, we have the obligation to pray for them. In Zoroastrian uh, tradition, in Armenian Zoroastrianism, we had this, um, the cult of ancestors where uh, there, should have, uh, th there was an atrushan, a fireplace, which had to uh, burn all the time. And uh, there was a person, uh, usually it was the wife of the household, who would put uh, uh, some fire in it so that it keeps on going. And this was also linked to um, 
the fact that through that smoke, the ancestors were defending this household, like we do with incense now a little bit. It, it's more or less the same uh, concept when the incense is done. Uh, so, and that tradition uh, later on was expressed in the manuscripts and in the colophon writing. So I guess that's, that's the, the link to why we have this Hishatakaran, the place of memory. And the sponsor did not have any control over the colophons then? No, this was the interesting bit. The sponsor needed to have his <laughs> name there, and without that you couldn't write it. But the rest was just uh, uh, the, the scribe's uh, choice what to do and how to do it. Yeah, yeah that, that's another thing very interesting. I have a question, actually, uh, David. It was, it was a great talk, and it went so fast. Um, I would like to know a little bit more. Uh, you brought up the Mada, and, of course, I'm very interested in that. But what about any other, um, what else stood out for you in terms of daily life? What, what other, uh, can you remember um, other bits and pieces from the yeah. So one of the things, um, there was one uh, woman who sponsored a manuscript uh, because, and uh, there is a story, so she dedicated to her uh, son initially. She says, my son was uh, a merchant and he uh, traveled to India and on his way back home, the infidels uh, killed him and stole all his uh, stuff. And then the continuation of it, uh, we have uh, again uh, the same woman saying, and I also dedicate this to my husband who went in search of my son, of his body to bring it back, but he was also killed there. So a very tragic uh, thing. But again, we see uh, I mean, this uh, small reference to um, uh, to um, this merchant activity that from Armenia they were traveling to India to bring some stuff um, another thing was uh, when they were um, one of the funny things uh, I remember when the scribe curses uh, a fly saying this uh, this fly is uh, bothering me all the time and I cannot finish this work. And when I left my manuscript and went uh, to have some food, came back, this fly was sitting on the manuscript and drinking the ink. I'm going to kill it or something like that. But he was basically very angry with that fly. And so he wrote this in a manuscript. Um, one more thing that was really interesting uh, comes from Tabriz. Uh, so it's uh, 1389, if I'm not mistaken. So the Armenian scribe says, well, I was writing, I was copying this uh, gospel and uh, we were attacked by the Timurids. So the Turks, Armenians and the Kurds of Tabriz joined the forces to fight the enemy and we managed to, de uh, to defend our city. So this was a very interesting uh, revelation for me. So the Turks, Armenians and Kurds in the city living, to, and, and the Persians, sorry, of course, and the Persians. Uh, so they all joined together the forces to fight against the, the invaders. Sometimes uh, there are references uh, to uh, money, different money that they use. One thing, yeah, this is also, I guess, very important. It tells a lot about the mentality of Armenians. So uh, sometimes when uh, someone would come and attack uh, a village, they would take uh, the manuscripts away. They would steal the manuscripts, rob the place, and one of the things that they would rob uh, would be the manuscripts. Most of them were had a very nice cover, sometimes made of silver, sometimes with some beautiful gems on it. And uh, they would keep it, uh, usually these were either Kurds attacking um, or uh, the invaders like Turkoman tribes. Um, so they would keep it in their headquarters. And then they would ask the Armenians to come and uh, if they want it back, they could ransom it. So when you read the colophons at the end of the manuscript, you see that these people cared so much about it. So one of them had to sell his cow, his only cow, he says. I sold my own cow to ransom this manuscript from captivity and this is how it is described it was a captivity uh, so they would just uh, do everything to bring it back to the village because uh, it was so precious for them so uh, yeah uh, this is perhaps uh, this tells us a lot about the mentality of people how much that manuscript meant to them thank you that that does tell a lot and the word captivity is very interesting do, do was there a um 
a sense of these being alive in their own way? I think so. I think uh, that was the idea because most of these manuscripts were not just kept somewhere. They were actually uh, part of the liturgy. They were read uh, during uh, specific festivities. So it was part of their culture. I, uh, there, was, there is no reference to it as something alive, but that word uh, captivity is really uh, striking that this is how they treated it as if it was a human being who needs some ransoming and they would do everything. Uh, in one case, we have the entire village put, uh, the, bringing all the jewelries that they uh, have, uh, had left to uh, take uh, one of them, a representative, takes it to the uh, shah and asks them to uh, give it back uh, in return for this uh, gold and they ransom it again. And the, the colophon usually is very joyful. We managed to do this and now it will be kept in this particular place and so on. Thank you, David. Uh, like Susan was saying, it's, we didn't realize how this time has passed. We have one last question from Rubina who is asking, are marginale also considered to be colophons? daily life details etc which are found on some pages written in the margins yeah so uh, we have these two different terms marginalia and colophons in the western tradition uh, when you take the armenian uh, collection of colophons of hishata karans uh, uh, i should mention the name of this great scholar um, um, uh, Hachikan, um who collected, who was the first one, Levon Khachigan, who was the first one who collected all of these um, uh, colophons from the Matena, primarily from the Matena Daran collection. That was uh, kind of his first uh, thing. And he put uh, not only the colophons, but also the marginalia, because uh, most of them had also this uh, reference to the memory. So uh, because of the uh, idea that uh, colophon is something in the Armenian tradition that is linked to um, uh, the memory, whatever re uh, reflected memory, and the marginalia would clearly do this. Um, uh, they, they, they were, it, it, it is considered to be part of the Hishatakaran collection. So that's why I also refer to some marginalia, like the one with the Catholic Armenian who was uh, constantly uh, criticizing Grigor Tatevati, saying that, uh, yeah, you are doing this and you are doing that. It is indeed um, in the Armenian tradition, we do consider it as part of uh, the, the Hishatakaran. Uh, Thank you, David. I think we'll let you go and enjoy your evening now. Thank you very much from everyone, Thank I'm sure. Thank you for having me. Thank you to my colleagues as well for organizing and supporting this. Uh, I'd like to uh, tell everyone, please save a date, 15th of November, where we're going to hold a big fundraiser to support All Armenian Fund in Madram, which David has already mentioned and um, support displaced families from um, Artsakh. Um, keep an eye on our website, details are coming soon. We have a few big names booked, which is still a secret, Susan. Yes, yes, I'm not allowed to say anything, but mm -hmm. lots of exciting news coming up. We'll be still organizing forums about Karabakh and ongoing situation. So there is, there is a lot com coming up. Thank you very much, David, again. And uh, Thank thanks, thanks everyone for joining. Keep in touch. Uh, Bye-bye. Thank you.